let's get a snapshot still because we're not quite there yet. Bogdan Klitsch, Poland is a country obviously that has been heavily impacted by this war. I know your country has taken in a large influx of Ukrainian refugees, um, has been warning uh, about uh, Russia and Vladimir Putin in particular for many years, something that perhaps some of your European partners did not take to heart. Let's get a quick snapshot from uh, the view from Warsaw as well, and <coughs> before we dive into what this war actually means for the future of the EU. I don't want to exaggerate, but uh, it was last year here during this conference that we were talking also about uh, the Russian threat and uh, I warned about uh, not only militarization of the foreign policy of uh, the Russian Federation, but also uh, on plans uh, of Vladimir Putin to reintegrate as biggest part of uh, the former Soviet Union, including Ukraine as an indispensable part of this, uh, of this plan. By the way, I mentioned also the soft annexation of Belarus that at that time mm was almost uh, completed, but uh, let's say frankly that uh, prob probably even in November or December, nobody expected such a... There was a, uh, it was CIA that knew uh, from the very beginning of uh, November and shared this, uh, uh, those informations with uh, partners in, uh, in Europe about full-scale war that was planned by uh, Vladimir Putin, but we believed rather that there will be an uh, operation uh, limited to the southern and uh, eastern part of, uh, uh, of Ukraine, uh, uh, not with the operational goal that is uh, so, uh, so visible right now, because the operational goal of this, uh, uh, of this war of Vladimir Putin against uh, Ukraine is to destroy the statehood uh, of Ukrainian, uh, of Ukrainian state and to uh, exterminate its uh, inhabitants. I underlined it because uh, uh, we witness not, we observe not only war crimes, we observe not only crimes against humanity in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, not only in Bucha, Irpin, uh, not only in Hostomel, uh, uh, in Mariupol and other places, but everywhere in uh, in that country, but we also see the examples of genocide, uh, genocide there, and it was expressed several times very clearly by uh, either Putin himself or his uh, his uh, 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 collaborators. Uh, but there are two other uh, operational goals that are important. Uh, not only for Ukraine, but also for European and Atlantic community. I would say destabilization of uh, the European Union and paralysis of, uh, of NATO. They were expressed uh, just before the beginning of this full-scale war in Ukraine in the famous ultimatum of President uh, Putin to, uh, to the West. Uh, so, uh, uh, from Polish perspective, if you uh, ask about that, uh, this is the war that, uh, uh, that refers not only to Ukrainian nation, not only to Ukrainian statehood, but also to the European Union and Atlantic community as a, as a whole. That's why we are uh, satisfied with, the, uh, with three uh, important uh, uh, new factors. The first one, it is the return of the United States to Europe. President Biden declared that during his campaign, and he did it uh, at least since uh, June 2021, when, uh, as we remember, when he paid his first visit to Europe, uh, taking part in three summits, G7 summit, uh, uh, NATO summit, but also the European Council also the European Council, and uh, there are consequences of, uh, of that. That's first. Secondly, uh, uh, the important uh, consequence of, uh, of this war was uh, political reintegration of, uh, of the Alliance. Uh, NATO was uh, split uh, during uh, President uh, Trump's uh, uh, presidency uh, strip, uh, uh, very deeply. There was a military unity and uh, because of uh, 
military commanders of uh, NATO, uh, the alliance uh, went ahead, but there was a political split and the lack of political unity. So after the beginning of the war in Ukraine, NATO presented itself as, a, as an integrated entity. And the third one, it is the reaction of the European Union, frankly speaking, as a chair of the Foreign Affairs and the European Union's uh, Committee of Polish Senate, I haven't seen before such a speed, such an acceleration of, an, uh, of <coughs> the legislative process concerning uh, external threats, Ukraine mainly, that in only in two weeks uh, from the beginning by the European Commission to the, to the final decision of the European uh, Union's uh, Council, there is, uh, uh, there, the main acts are adopted and uh, uh, such a big amount of money that was allocated from the, use, uh, from the European Peace Facility to support Ukraine, it means uh, 3.1 uh, billion euro for military expenses, only for military expenses. So how much did you say? 3.1. Only for military yeah. expenses from the European Peace no. Facility. I don't <coughs> mention, you know, uh, more than uh, uh, no, 13 uh, billion euro from, uh, for the microeconomic uh, aid. Yes. And those that but were designed for next year, I mean, at least e uh, 18 uh, billion but euro. The EPF it would be yeah. is around 4.6. Yeah. I mentioned, you know, the European Peace Facility yeah, the EPF with 3.1. Yeah. It's more than that now. Yeah. But Europe, I, I think the point, uh, figures aside, uh, the point you're making is quite clear. Europe has uh, acted uncharacteristically, perhaps, acted swiftly, uh, uh, moving around the red tape that often uh, uh, involves uh, decision-making in Brussels and has uh, acted uh, with uh, decision uh, and resolve here. Uh, Bogdan Klitsch, thank you so much. I will come back to you, of course, uh, as this discussion involves...